I want to tell you a story. You know the ending already. But there was a, a certain man who was a thief. He wasn't just a thief. He was a, he was a lifelong thief. He was a career criminal, we would call him. As a thief, he was also a liar because someone who steals also has to lie about where they got it and what they did with it. And so we we can be pretty certain that this man spent his life lying and stealing. We can also be certain that he had been arrested more than once and perhaps he'd spent some time in jail now and then. But every time he got out of jail, like the fool in Proverbs who receives a hundred lashes and goes back to his foolishness, he continued going back to his thievery over and over and over again. We can also be pretty certain his parents didn't, didn't approve because his parents would have, been, would have been Jews who knew the law. And so to continue in his thievery, he walked away from his family to do so, walked away from any truth he had known, any of the the word of God or the law of God he had known. He had to put it aside in order to continue his life of thievery. He was such a thief that one day a judge said to him, we are no longer going to put up with your thievery. You have stolen from enough people in our community. It is now time that you pay the final price for your thievery. And we're going to put you to death as a thief. The man found himself hanging on a cross next to another thief. But the man between them was different. The man between them, as he was hanging on the cross, he said something like this. He he asked God in heaven to forgive the people who had put him up on the cross. The other thief began to mock the man in the middle, but this thief, this lifetime criminal, something in his heart changed that moment. And he enjoyed the long suffering of God. Because when he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom, Jesus said to him, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And suddenly an entire lifetime of thievery and of lying was completely wiped away in the long suffering of God. I want to bring a message today entitled, The Fruit of the Spirit is Long Suffering Unto Salvation. I want to explain the difference of patience and long suffering, perseverance and long suffering. And I want you to understand that there's a fruit of the Spirit that God gives to us so we can show the long-suffering of God to those around us who need Jesus. There's two words in the Bible that are translated patience. The first word is the word hupomene. It's almost always translated patience, and and it gives the idea of patient endurance. Put the word hupomene up there. There we go. This word is the idea of putting up with someone that, that bothers you. Maybe your friend brings somebody over and they're just a, a complete annoyance. And you show this person patience because you know it doesn't have to be for very long. Maybe it's a brother or sister who you just don't enjoy being around, but when they come to family gatherings, you put on a little bit of patience because they're not staying very long and they're going to leave. Patience, this idea, this hoop of many idea of patience, seems to be the idea of, of, of a patience that we only have to put up with. But we're really glad when the person's gone and the situation is over and we can get back to not having to be patient with that person again. The second word is more interesting. It is the word macrothumia. The word macrothumia is different than patience. It comes from two words, the word macro, which means large, and the word thumos, that means temper. This word literally means being long-tempered. It's translated long-suffering. It's the opposite of short-tempered, having a short fuse. 
without macro thumi, or without this long suffering, we tend to be temperamental. We tend to have an irritable temperament once in a while, or even a bad temper. We tend to lose patience, lose our cool, and even blow up once in a while. The word in Galatians 5.22, and I'm going to bring up some other places where this word is used, is this word macrothumia. It is the word long-suffering. And so the key point of today's message is this. The Bible uses this word macrothumia when speaking of long-suffering toward a person or a group that needs to be saved. So I want you to see the difference then between hupomene, patience, and macrothumia, long-suffering. Because this is a very important difference. The fruit of the Spirit is not patience. Even though this word might be in your Bible, it's not really the word that communicates the idea best. The word long-suffering communicates this idea so much better. The fruit of the Spirit is truly long-suffering. And I want to show you today that the long-suffering of God leads toward his desire to save somebody. The thief on the cross enjoyed the long-suffering of God after a lifetime of rejecting him. If you can imagine with me for just a moment that throughout this thief's life, God showed forbearance, which is a divine overlooking of this man's sin, allowing him to live to the moment when God knew he would cry out to Jesus to be saved from his sin. The long-suffering of God let this man live throughout his wicked life until God chose to save him. Maybe there's been people in your life that are hard to get along with, but you knew they were lost. You knew they needed a Savior. And so you really tried to put up with them because you knew they were lost. We find that long-suffering is the opposite of anger. It's the opposite of an outburst of wrath. I've driven with Christian people. And when the traffic light turned and the person in front didn't move, my Christian friend who was driving begins to yell at the person in the car in front of them. I'm like, I'm thinking, wait just a minute. That's the opposite of patience or long-suffering. You just ripped that person apart for not hitting their gas pedal fast enough. Or they cut in front of you and they took a, t- a whole two seconds out of your life and you've lost your temper on them. That's the opposite of long-suffering, isn't it? We tend to overreact. We tend to get defensive. We intend to interpret a remark as an attack on us and then to attack back. We, we tend to carry a level of anger somewhere in us, kind of like the secret of the Hulk. <laughs> He's always angry. <laughs> doesn't get angry. Some people have a level of anger within them all the time. The slightest provocation brings the anger to the surface. But the fruit of the Spirit is different. This idea of long-suffering doesn't come from that spirit of anger at all, which is why it is a fruit of the Spirit. It is not of the flesh. Of our flesh, we are angry. Of our flesh, we are quick to react and quick to defend. The fruit of the Spirit is very different. This fruit of the Spirit then comes from God. It is a fruit of the Spirit. I can't tell you today that you need to practice long-suffering if you do not possess the Holy Spirit of God, for you cannot. You cannot put anger aside if you do not know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. If you do not possess His Holy Spirit, then this, this idea of putting aside this anger and living with an attitude of long-suffering is something you might try, but I'll tell you a secret, you're going to fail. You cannot try to be long-suffering like you might try a certain type of food or a certain type of shoes. If you try, you will fail. No, this is a fruit of the Spirit in your life. I can say we don't have a right to anger when we're called to be long-suffering. 
we feel an entitlement sometime to anger, but not if we're called to long suffering. Think about the compassion of Jesus for the thief on the cross. What moment of life was Jesus living when he offered the long suffering of God to the man next to him? Remember, they weren't sitting in a coffee shop having a conversation. They weren't having trouble on a project at work. They were both impaled with nails through their wrists and their feet, laboring for every breath, their backs ripped open, their blood pouring down their bodies as this man cries to Jesus for mercy. And Jesus, in the opposite of humanity, shows long-suffering toward a lifetime sinner. This should amaze us when we think about this call to long-suffering. Over and over, God waited for Israel and showed his long-suffering to them. We'll look at that in a moment. So I want you to see that God's long-suffering is not without a reason. Can you, can you see that with me today? We don't just practice long-suffering to be godly. Long-suffering has a reason. And the reason is that somebody that we are showing long-suffering toward would cry out to God for mercy and be saved. Let's look at some examples today. Our first example is the salvation of Saul of Tarsus. Later, the Apostle Paul. God showed himself to have a pattern of long-suffering as he waited for him to believe in Jesus. This morning, Axel read to us from 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17 about the conversion of Saul and who he was before he was converted. I want to take a few points here and identify who Saul was before he was converted. And perhaps you can put yourself in this, some of these points, or perhaps you can put somebody that you're struggling with in these points as we think about God's long-suffering towards Saul of Tarsus. First of all, Paul said, I was a blasphemer. I was a blasphemer. What was a blasphemer? Well, as a blasphemer, Saul of Tarsus used his tongue to speak evil, to slander others, to rail on people, and to abuse. This is what a slander, a blasphemer is. A blasphemer uses his mouth, uses her tongue to speak evil of others, to slander others, to rail on people, and to use their words to abuse. Do you know somebody that treats you this way, that treats you with blasphemy? Not just blaspheming God, but they use their tongue upon you. Paul said, I was a persecutor. As a persecutor, Saul of Tarsus used his official position. He had permission from the high priest. He used his official position to hurt people. And he hurt people that he believed were in the wrong. Were the Christians in Saul's day, were they in the right or the wrong? Well, they were in the right. What did Saul think? He thought they were in the wrong. And so since he was convinced they were in the wrong, he used his position of authority to persecute them. Is there somebody in your life that uses their position to harass you? Uses their position to, to accuse you of being in the wrong when you're really in the right? Paul said, I was a violent man. Not only did he use his, his tongue and his position, Paul used his hands to, to treat people with violence. He would beat them. He'd put them in chains. He'd put them in jail. He would drag them perhaps behind a, a horse back to Jerusalem where he'd put them on trial for being a Christian. And he took pride in his violence. Again, Perhaps you've been mistreated physically, mentally, by someone. Paul said he was prideful. As a prideful man, Saul of Tarsus, he would heap insulting language on people. 
He treated people with disrespect. He treated people with shame. These were his own countrymen. These were fellow Jews. He didn't care. In his mind, he was above them. He had every right in his mind to mistreat them, to treat them with disrespect, to treat them with shame. This is not the kind of man or woman that we might look at and say, one day God's going to save you, I just know it. This is not the kind of, kind of person that we would want to practice long-suffering toward. This is the kind of person we want to get away from. We wouldn't look at that kind of person and say, one day they're going to be a missionary and preach God's peace around the world. But aren't you glad that God in his long suffering put up with Saul of Tarsus' sin? Until the day that Saul looked into the heaven and he saw the risen Jesus and he said, Who are you, Lord? And what would you have me to do? Aren't you thankful for the long suffering of God to actually bring this man to conversion who would give us more than half of the New Testament? Who would give us such wonderful instruction of how to live and why to live that way? to teach us of the mysteries of God. 2 Peter 3.9 helps us understand this. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises as some understand slowness. and said He is patient. And the word there is that macrothumia word. He is long-suffering, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In God's long-suffering, He wanted Saul of Tarsus to come to repentance, and He did. And perhaps this person who totally mistreats you, God wants to save them. But they need to see the long-suffering of God. When the Spirit of God spoke to Saul of Tarsus, he said, Saul, isn't it hard for you to kick against the goads? A goad was, was a long stick with a nail in it that a, a shepherd might use to, to prod the sheep or to, to get a cow moving across the road. And God had sent people in Saul of Tarsus' life that were the goads of God, the, that nail and a stick to say, you shouldn't do this. You should listen to this. Perhaps there were Christians who, as, as Saul was mistreating them, he said, I, they would say, Saul, we're praying for you. Saul, you need to believe in Jesus. Saul, one day you're going to be one of God's people, as a, a, one, one redeemed by Jesus. And he would mock them and beat them harder, I'm certain. But those constant pricks from the people of God, Saul could not get away from. And though the God's long-suffering, he used all of that to bring Saul to salvation. In the Old Testament, God showed his long-suffering towards salvation. Look with me a couple of references, Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering, while abounding in mercy, forgiving iniquity, and transgressions. Some people say that the God of the Old Testament was mean and the God of the New Testament was nice. <laughs> Same God, all right? This is the book of Numbers. This is the Old Testament God. Look what it says of him. He is long-suffering, abounding in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Look at the next verse with me. Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious, what's it say? And full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Before the flood, God was long-suffering to the world. 1 Peter 3.20 says he was, that God was long-suffering as Noah built the ark. God was long-suffering with Sodom, remember? If you can find ten righteous people, I'll spare that city, because those ten righteous can then preach the gospel there. God was long-suffering toward the family of Jacob. You ever wonder about that? The sons of Jacob, they were pretty bad guys. If you think your family was dysfunctional, imagine having four moms, 12 kids, one favorite, and all, those, all except the one favorite were a mess. 
what a, what a messed up family. But God in his long suffering brought that family together that, that through them his nation might develop and might grow. In his long suffering, God sent them to Egypt where they could become a great nation. And then in his long suffering, he brought them out of Egypt and led them across the wilderness to the promised land, even though they griped and complained all the way. God had an end game. It was the promised land, the place of their salvation. God was long-suffering with the people of Nineveh. God sent a prophet, Jonah, when they should have been wiped out like the Amalekites, but God showed long-suffering toward the people of Nineveh instead. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God loving his people sending prophets to call them back to himself. And it was only when God determined there was not any good left in them that he sent his judgment. After Solomon, the nation split, the northern northern kingdom never had a revival. Ended up ultimately being defeated, taken into captivity. The southern kingdom had several revivals, but eventually they too turned hard against God. They ended up in Babylon for 70 years after their city and towns were destroyed. But you know, even in judgment, God was long-suffering toward his people. He did not wipe them out in exile. He left a remnant to bring them back because his purposes still were before him. This is the long-suffering God who is long-suffering toward salvation. In the New Testament, we continue to see God's call and his long-suffering toward our salvation. I'm kind of giving you a Bible lesson today, right? We're defining long-suffering. Then I want you to see the God of the Old Testament was long-suffering. We also see long-suffering taught in the New Testament. In Matthew 23, 13 to 39, we're not going to read all those verses today. But in this passage, Jesus gives seven woes to the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers. Seven woes, why they were so bad. But he finishes with this. He says, blessed is he. He says, he says Jesus, less than he says, one day, he said, You will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At the end of seven seven woes of judgment upon them, he says, one day you will rejoice in my salvation. This is his long-suffering. Jesus taught the long-suffering of God in his parables. Just think about this with me for a moment, okay? In the parables, the prodigal son reveals the long-suffering of the father whom the son rejected. The son mistreated the father. He disrespected the father in every way imaginable. But the father patiently waits for the son day after day, longing for the son to return so he might restore him to the position of honor. The long-suffering of the master who forgives his servant of an unpayable debt. That parable is a picture of our debt before God. It is unpayable. And the only reason God forgives the debt of our sin is because of his mercy, his long suffering toward us. In Romans, Paul teaches that we are not to despise the riches of God's goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering. That we should know that it is the long suffering of God that brings us to repentance. Do you see how throughout the scripture, this idea of long-suffering has to do with repentance to salvation? It's not just putting up with somebody. This is an attitude the Spirit of God gives us to care for people to their salvation. So I want you to see the the last point this morning is just a, a kind of a capsule of all this. We, the people of God, are called to treat others with this long-suffering of God unto their salvation. God brings somebody across your life, and they're just like sandpaper. 
Do you have people like that? They're just like sandpaper. Whenever you're with them, it's not like putting on a nice piece of cotton or a nice piece of silk that doesn't, that just kind of fits your skin. Whenever you're around them, they just rub you wrong. They're like sandpaper to you. But you know that they're lost. You know their life is filled with pain. Pain that's been put upon them and pain that they have inflicted and pain they give to others. Their life is a life filled with pain. What should your heart be toward them? It should be a heart of long-suffering. Ephesians 4, Paul writes these words, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Notice what he says. Here's our calling. With all humility and gentleness, with what? Long-suffering. And what does that mean? Well, that means we bear with each other in love. I told you that Jesus forbear the sin of the thief next to him. He looked over all the sin of his life to show him compassion. And here, long-suffering is defined as bearing with one another in love. Okay, you've hurt me. What am I supposed to do with that? Hurt you back? Or am I supposed to bear with it and show you the long-suffering of Christ? Boy, Pastor, that's hard. It's very hard. That's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's not of your flesh. Colossians 3, 12. As the elect of God, we are to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Here I see long-suffering as a character quality of God himself. Again, you can't just put this on this is a fruit of the spirit of God in you a character quality of God 2 Peter 3 15 says that the long suffering of God is our salvation the long suffering of God is our salvation one more reference here <clears throat> is 2 Timothy 4 Paul says to preachers preach the word be ready, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. With what? With complete patience. And the word there is that macrothumia word. Preachers are supposed to preach with long suffering. The pastor is not supposed to get up and beat the congregation. The pulpit should never be a whipping post from which you, you go away feeling like you just got beat up. The pastor should communicate the word of God with long suffering, recognizing the need of each person to come to Jesus. What does this do for us today? What does this do when we have to live in a world full of people like Saul of Tarsus? People around us just as bad as him. What are we to do? Remember Ananias? My mic is catching somewhere, so if I can fix that. I'm not sure why I made all this noise all of a sudden. Try that, see if that helps any. Remember Ananias? The angel said to Ananias, there's a man I want you to meet. His name is Saul of Tarsus. He's blind. I want you to go pray for him. Remember what Ananias said? He said, in essence, are you crazy? This guy came here to kill us. You want me to go and pray for him? He came here with orders to arrest me and to take me back in chains. I know what he's done in other places. I, I, I don't want to go and pray for him. We aren't the first people to struggle with long-suffering toward hard people, okay? It's not an easy call. Here's a big picture for us today. The big picture of the fruit of the Spirit being long-suffering is this. God calls us to be patient with those who are lost in their sin and separated from Him. That's their condition. 
They are lost in their sin. They are separated from God. And remember also, while they are lost in their sin, the God of this world has blinded their eyes to the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. There are some people that if you try to give them the gospel, they're not ready. They've got rocks in their field. It might take years of long-suffering care. It might take years of showing the love of Christ when, when it's difficult before you can ever speak to them of Jesus. And you might never be the one to speak to them of Jesus. You might just be the person to take the rocks out of the field because God is the one showing long-suffering toward them. They are separated from God until He opens their spiritual eyes and gives them the gift of faith to believe. My brothers and sisters, I don't want to stand before God one day, and neither do you. And for God to say, you know what, Steve, I brought somebody into your life, and you didn't do very well. You weren't long-suffering with them. I wanted you to be a picture of my long-suffering to them, and you pretty much gave their anger right back. I don't want to hear that. I'm afraid I, I will for some people. We tried. There was a neighbor we had. We tried really hard to show this neighbor Jesus, and wow. 20 years trying to show her Jesus, and we got cussed at and yelled at and didn't speak to us for a year at a time more than once, and we're like, Lord, this, this, this neighbor's impossible to show your love to. Those people are going to be in your life. Remember one of the qualities of, patient, of love? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. And again, this is God's love, right? Not human love. Human love is so selfish. Human love has so many limits. But if we're going to love people with the love of God, it is His love we want to flow through us, not our own. So in study for today's message, I came across James 5, 7, and 8. I think James kind of wraps all this together for us. Now, I want you to know that I have taken one liberty here. I, did, I didn't change the Bible, all right? I changed the translation. <laughs> because the word in James, each time this word is used, and you, if you've memorized this, you've memorized it with the word patient. Because that's the word the translators put in. But it's the Greek word makrothumia. So I'm going to put, that, put the word long-suffering into James' writings to see if this wraps it up for us today, okay? You understand where I'm coming from here? I'm not taking a liberty. I'm using the word that we're trying to understand today. James 5, 7. Be long-suffering then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop with long suffering, waiting for the autumn and spring rains. So you too be long suffering and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. James uses a very simple illustration the farmer plants his seed. Any farmers here? No, Patrick's a farmer. Any, any other farmers here? Any raised on a farm? Any of you raised on a farm? Yes? No? Okay. Somewhat. I grew up around farms and had some farmer friends. The farmer doesn't make the seed grow. The farmer puts the seed in the ground. He may fertilize it. He may take the weeds out and he may water it. But the farmer doesn't make the seed grow. He has to wait for it to grow. One farmer friend of mine told me, he said, he said, if we get too much rain in harvest, we lose the whole crop. He said, if we don't get enough rain in the middle time, he said, we can lose the whole crop. He said, if a, a, a flock of, uh, of bugs come through, we can lose a crop. He said, he said, the harvest really belongs to the Lord. He was a Christian farmer. And he said, I, I don't know why. He said, some years we have a good harvest, some years we don't. And I don't know why God, in, in his wisdom, gives me a bad harvest. I learned from him that, the, that, that the, the, the harvest belongs to the Lord. You do the best you can. And here James uses that, and he says to us, be long-suffering. The harvest belongs to God. It's not your job to make the seed grow. It's your job to plant it. 
And it's your job to treat it the right way until the harvest. Just before Christ ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples. How do you do that? Well, it's not just memorize a few verses and go out and give somebody a gospel plan. It's treating people with the long-suffering of God wherever we go. Showing them His love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and long-suffering. And when those are woven together, we are much more effective disciple-makers. I kind of hope today that you'll leave here thinking about the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering unto salvation. I kind of hope that you'll look at people that you know that need Jesus, those sandpaper people, and you'll ask God to give you long-suffering toward them, that perhaps they're another Saul of Tarsus. Perhaps they're the thief on the cross. But if God wants to save them, and he's put you in their life to show his long-suffering, may we be faithful to show the long-suffering of God unto salvation. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, today for the fruit of the Spirit that you give in our life. For we are well aware we can't fabricate these. We can't make this up. We can't just become better. This is you at work in us. Lord, help us to get out of the way. Help us to allow your fruit to flow through us. And may we treat one another differently because the fruit that flows through us. Lord, may we be more like those who showed long-suffering to Saul of Tarsus. May we be more like Christ on the cross who showed long-suffering to a lifetime thief. And Father, we're coming to you to ask us, to, to ask you to help us to treat people in a way that shows them that you love them and that you've got a purpose for them, and that purpose is their salvation. And Lord, if anybody here today does not know you as Savior, I pray that they would know that you are treating them with long-suffering, that you are putting up with their sin until the day they come to you for salvation. And Father, I pray that men and women here today who might need Jesus would yet before this day ends hear your call and would cry out to you like the thief, like Saul of Tarsus, and be saved from their sin through your long suffering unto salvation. In Jesus' name.